Welcome to this week's free seminar. I'm Mark Kivas. I'm filling in just this week for Ziv, who's apparently right now climbing Mount Kilimanjaro on this holiday. Um, our speaker today is Professor John Matthews. Um, he's um, a professor of, let me get this right, um, Strategic Management at Macquarie University and is Professor of Competitive Dynamics and Global Strategy at Guido Carli University in Rome. Okay. <laughs> And his research interests are the competitive and technological dynamics of the rise of new industrial powers in East Asia. And most recently, he's been interested in the rise of um, renewables and the greening of the global economy, especially with respect to China. Um, he's got a new book coming out soon called The Greening of Capitalism, How Asia is Driving the Next um, Great Transformation. Um, and he's actually also got a recent paper in Nature, which I've run off a few copies. John's kindly let us distribute that. So I've got a few copies of that to go around. And also the, today's PowerPoint slides, I've got printouts of that. So there's 25, hopefully that's enough to go around. Um, if you want to pass them around. Okay, so um, we're, I think we're ready to go. So please join me in welcoming uh, John to Spree and UNSW. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction, uh, Mark, and uh, thank you all for coming to this event. It's very exciting for me as a, somebody outside the field of science and technology, but very much uh, observing what has been going on in the field of renewables. It's very exciting to be here. This is, after all, uh, one of the, uh, the mecca of photovoltaic research uh, and uh, uh, when, when we look at that uh, complicated NRL chart of the improving efficiencies of solar cells, we see UNSW right there as one of the centers of advance. So very nice to be here. Uh, and uh, my theme, I've given you uh, a long title here, which uh, is reflected in the article that was published in Nature a month ago on renewables and energy security, learning curves, and the greening of capitalism. And I'll uh, I'll try to make sense of that combination uh, for you as we go through. So here's a rather busy slide, but I uh, just want to establish a few points and then I'll get on to looking at the evidence that supports these. As a good social scientist, I like to look at the data and then I try to draw some inferences from that data. And uh, what we have here with the renewables revolution is not a cost, the way that uh, mainstream economists talk about the issues, not a cost, but an enormous business opportunity. Indeed, as we uh, make the transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewables, it will be the largest uh, business opportunity of the 21st century. And yet we're still uh, confined, constrained by the economic uh, discourse uh, to talk about costs and adding further costs to the fossil fuel producers. Uh, like carbon taxes and cap and trade systems. Well, my, my point on that is, when you look at the major uh, technological transitions of the past, uh, such as from canals to railroads in the 19th century, was that successfully achieved through a tax on canals? No, it wasn't. And neither will the transition from uh, fossil fuels to renewables be achieved in itself through a tax on fossil fuels. It will be achieved through some different mechanism and that different mechanism is capitalist competition and the competition is going to come from the country that has to make this transition if it wants to have a viable standard of living in the 21st century and that country is China. So my uh, perspective on these uh, issues is very different from the one that you hear about with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and many other organizations that start with a moral imperative, arguing that there is a moral imperative to move off fossil fuels because of their carbon emissions. My point is that we're talking actually about a economic imperative and the economic imperative is being borne by China and then to some extent India and then Brazil and then all the other countries that are looking to industrialize. So, uh, renewable energies can be seen as a means of enhancing energy security 
rather than necessarily as a means of reducing carbon emissions. And that's the fundamental point that I'm making, and I want to show you some data that will support that kind of argument. And this is where we start. We start with what happened in Britain uh, between 1760 and 1860. Something extraordinary happened. Uh, we all know it as the Industrial Revolution, but why is it so important? And the reason is here that per capita income increased without uh, the strain on population. So in previous uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years, uh, economies had seen improvements in agricultural productivity, for example, and improvements in per capita income. But then uh, the forces of war and pestilence, disease, would uh, move in and bring it back again. But the thing in Britain was that the per capita income increased without triggering any of those kinds of responses. So the, it just kept on growing. And as we all know, it kept on growing uh, right through the 19th and then 20th century. And then the rest of the world was following. So it works, in other words. If you want to be a wealthy country, you have to industrialize. That is the message. China has heard that message loud and clear, and it intends to raise its billions of people uh, out of poverty uh, through industrialization. It works. It's the only known mechanism for raising people's per capita income and wealth. And China is doing it. Then India is doing it. The whole world wants to do it. And here we come to the first uh, inconvenient truth. And the inconvenient truth is that they can't do it the way the West did it, with fossil fuels, uh, with uh, almost unlimited access to resources, and with finance that wasn't asking questions about how it would all be done. So how do they solve that issue? Well, we look at uh, the way manufacturing trends are moving around the world. Here's a chart from the OECD that shows you the blue line at the top is manufacturing value added, added in the OECD countries, that is the wealthy countries, and the red line is the manufacturing value added in non-OECD countries, for which read China and maybe India. And you can see that the red line is coming up, the blue line is coming down, and they're going to cross before the year 2020. And when they cross, the world changes. The world becomes a Sinocentric world. And that Sinocentric world will have to have a very different perspective on energy. That's my starting point, and it starts with this data showing you that the world of manufacturing will become Sinocentric before the year 2020, and that means that uh, per capita incomes will rise just as they did in Britain in the 18th century. You see here, uh, Japan was the first East Asian country uh, to rise. That's the yellow line. Then Korea, almost uh, uh, now a wealthy country alongside Japan, and you can see then China with the blue and India with the red uh, running hard uh, and clearly focused on the goal of catching up with those East Asian neighbours. So what is going on in China to drive this manufacturing revolution which they see as underpinning their industrial revolution? Well, what is underpinning it is an energy revolution. And this energy revolution in China, just like all the other Western countries and Japan before it, is based on fossil fuels, on coal. So here we see the enormous increase in coal consumption and the enormous increase in electric power output by China, which underpins its manufacturing system, this enormous manufacturing system. And there's a very clear inflection point here in the year 2001. Can I ask the audience, what happened in 2001? Why did China suddenly move into becoming a major consumer of coal and producer of coal-fired electric power? What happened in 2001? China joined the WTO. China was open for business. It was safe to invest in China. China started developing multinationals. China joined the world economy in 2001, and you can see uh, the impact in terms of energy. But because the leadership in China understand that they cannot simply replicate the Western model of industrialization based on fossil fuels, they understand that they need some other approach, a different approach to energy, and that's reflected in this chart where you see wind power doubling every year. 
wind power doubling of, uh, every, every two years, say. But in fact, it's uh, been uh, increasing so rapidly that China's uh, wind power is now, uh, it's the largest uh, producer of wind turbines in the world and is just about to become the largest wind power producer itself. That is making a distinction between the manufacturing of turbines and the use of wind power on, in wind farms. So why is China doing this? This is the key uh, question that I'm asking in this presentation. Uh, and my answer is that China is doing it for reasons of energy security uh, rather than uh, reasons uh, to do with climate change. They're both important. Uh, they both uh, feed in uh, to each other. But it is energy security that is really driving this phenomenal commitment on the part of this very large country, China, to renewable power. And here you see wind. A similar story for solar photovoltaic. It's about to become a similar story for concentrated solar power, CSP, uh, and, uh, and many other forms of renewables. So the issues, in a nutshell, are that China is on the road to industrialization as the only known method of raising incomes. So China is on the road, but it can't follow that traditional pathway established by the West of utilizing fossil fuels, super abundant, super cheap fossil fuels. It can't do so, not just because of their implications for climate change, uh, but because of the issues to do with energy security. It can't produce all its own fossil fuels and therefore it's dependent on imports and many of those imports are coming from geopolitical hotspots. And uh, if you thought the 20th century was a world of uh, oil wars, well wait for the 21st century if China is dependent on that business as usual pathway, fossil fuel based pathway. So can an alternative to that pathway be built and can it be built in time? These are the very biggest questions of our time. There is no question more important than the question, can an alternative be built and can it be built in time and can China do it? So they are the three uh, starting points of my argument and uh, they're big questions, they're big issues, and let me show you some data to look at uh, what drives these issues. So here we see China's uh, imports of oil and at the top part, uh, India's imports. Now this is just a chart, just a piece of data. But what does it actually mean? If you look at uh, the China chart where the imports are growing year by year, what that means is that China, if it follows, if it follows this business as usual pathway, will be dependent more and more on imports of oil from the areas of the world that actually produce oil in the Middle East, in uh, countries like Venezuela, uh, Iran <coughs> and other places that are clearly unstable, that are geopolitical hotspots. If China continues on this pathway of expanding and expanding its oil imports, then the, com the, the implications for China and for the world will be war, revolution and terror. War, revolution and terror. Not three words that you usually hear in a seminar on energy. And yet that is what will happen if China follows this business as usual pathway. That's why China recognizes that it has to get off that pathway. And India as well, you can see uh, in uh, relative terms, uh, the risks are even greater. So you look at a chart like that and you read what might happen in the 21st century if China uh, does not make uh, the commitment to renewables that we see it starting to make. And indeed China has already started uh, past several important milestones. Now the world's largest oil importer, for example, is reported in the Financial Times and reported as the new gas guzzler. This was a milestone that China didn't really want uh, to, to pass, not, uh, not a characterization that it would like to, that it would be proud of. And the OECD, for their part, they look at the expansion of the oil consuming uh, system uh, and they see all the expansion in these non-OECD countries for which read China and India. So if that were to happen, then that would be curtains for the world industrial system. It would be uh, a the chaos induced by global warming, but it would also mean uh, oil wars on a huge scale. In terms of <coughs> accessing <coughs> the fossil fuels, extracting oil is getting more and more difficult, more and more expensive. 
uh, Michael Clare uh, talk, calls these extreme resources, and they're extreme because they're extremely difficult to access, they're extremely expensive, and they're extremely dangerous, as we know from what happened with the Deep Horizon off the Gulf, uh, off the Gulf Coast uh, in Mexico. So the oil industry uh, doesn't have an, an answer to this problem, uh, and uh, if we ask how we actually got into this uh, situation, we only have to look at what uh, our friend General Motors was doing in the United States through the 1930s and the 1940s. They were buying up public sector trolley, trolley bus systems, tramway systems, uh, the one in Houston, the one in Los Angeles, and as they bought them, they simply shut them down and trashed the trolley cars. So this was General Motors' great gift uh, to the world in the 20th century trashing the trolley, bar, the trolley buses and destroying the companies that operated the public transport systems to make the world more dependent on the automobile. And that was a strategy that succeeded, obviously, very, very well. Now, China is moving ahead uh, at an enormous rate on two fronts, uh, the energy front and the resources front. And I've only got one slide on the resources front, so I want to show that up front to show you but uh, China uses this concept of the circular economy, by which they mean the recirculation of resources. <coughs> but not, uh, not simply as uh, an issue to do with uh, recycling some finished product, but actually an industrial ecology concept of feeding outputs into inputs. So as you, in the sugar refinery here, for example, uh, as the sugar refinery produces uh, waste material called bagasse, all of the fibrous material, so that can then be fed into a cement mill, a paper pulp mill, uh, and they can, that can be uh, inputs uh, and more industrial activities to produce outputs. So this is what China calls the circular economy, and this will be the key to uh, solving the problem of uh, resource efficiency. So there's a lot more that could be said about that, uh, but I also want to focus on what China is doing uh, in terms of energy. So let me, uh, let me turn to that and demonstrate, first of all, that China's commitment to renewables is real and substantial and far, or, far and away uh, the most important in the world. Here's China with its uh, renewables uh, capacity uh, nudging 378 gigawatts uh, in the year 2013. And the National Development and Reform Commission in China has just released its targets for 2017. Anybody know what the target for renewables in China in 2017 is? 550 gigawatts. So that is more than half a trillion watts, just renewable energy, just renewable power. That is the target for 2017. Already the capacity is produced, that capacity of 378 gigawatts is producing more electrical energy than the combined electrical energy output of Germany and France combined. That is how large that system is already in China, going to grow to 550 gigawatts uh, by the year 2017, according to the NDNRC, and the NDNRC uh, is serious in its uh, projections. So we look at uh, electric power generation uh, right up to the year 2020. Renewables are certainly going to be accounting for 30% of the uh, capacity. You see the blue line going up there, and I haven't even caught up with the target for 2017 in this chart. Uh, this chart was prepared before that most recent uh, statement from the NDNRC. So that blue line should be steeper than it actually is, uh, and uh, it will be reaching 30% well before uh, 2020. Now, what drives uh, this uh, phenomenal uptake uh, in China is uh, the fact that all renewable devices are manufactured and manufacturing systems generate learning curves. So the learning curve, manufacturing and renewables are all intimately related and help to explain why China is making these enormous commitments to the renewables. Here we see the learning curve for photovoltaics coming down. Uh, 2011 is shown there, 2012 is further down that uh, line, 2013 even further down still. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, under the impact of China's manufacturing, the market has expanded, and as the market expands, the efficiencies grow, and uh, the 
the cost keeps falling uh, so that uh, the costs for photovoltaics first generation have fallen by 80% over the past five years. Now that is a phenomenal reduction and that's just first generation. In fact, the first generation cost reductions have been so strong that they've undercut the second generation where people like uh, First Solar are uh, located. Uh, and that's where Solyndra was. That's where Konaka was. And uh, what happened uh, and unprecedentedly was that first generation kept on bringing its costs down so that it actually undercut the costs of the second generation producers and put them out of business. Never uh, heard of in uh, industrial dynamics before. Then we have uh, this revolution uh, in perovskites. So again, I'm very pleased to be here where I learn firsthand about what is being done. And you see this uh, phenomenal yield curve or the efficiency curve of the actual light conversion uh, in the red on the side there. Clearly something important is going on with perovskites. Uh, clearly uh, there is uh, enormous scope if the technical problems can be solved. And that's where an intensive R&D has to be done to solve these problems uh, of uh, stability uh, and so on of the perovskites. But there's enormous potential there. Uh, and so when we look at the actual uh, costs of uh, production of uh, electric power uh, from uh, these uh, solar devices, uh, we see that uh, this chart uh, from the Fraunhofer Institute uh, in Germany uh, shows the uh, PV utility as coming in at uh, 10 cents or uh, 10 euro cents uh, per kilowatt hour or less. Uh, that would be uh, 100, 100 uh, euro per megawatt hour. Uh, that's a, you can see, getting down to so, so that it's comparable to the cheapest, uh, uh, to the coal that is, uh, that is hard uh, and uh, still above the uh, lignite coal. But you can see we're getting into the same ballpark. When we look at other solar technologies uh, like concentrating solar power, uh, that too is riding a significant learning curve. Uh, here's uh, a chart from the Sunshot program in the US showing 21 cents uh, per kilowatt hour in 2010, falling to 13 cents per kilowatt hour in 2013 and projected to get as low as 6 cents per kilowatt hour in 2020. When you're under 10 cents per kilowatt hour, you have competitive electrical energy uh, whether it's produced from solar photovoltaics or concentrating solar power or dirty coal. And the point is the manufactured systems will then start to have a superiority because they embody a learning curve. That is the key to manufacturing as opposed to just digging stuff out of the ground, which is what they do with uh, coal and oil. Now already, I mentioned this is going to be the biggest business opportunity of the 21st century. Here are three billionaires who have already caught on to this. Uh, so you have Elon Musk uh, in the United States, the founder of Tesla Motors, already a multi-billionaire and uh, the one driving uh, the electric vehicle revolution in the United States and the associated revolutions in battery production. Already his uh, giga battery uh, plant will be the largest in the United States producing batteries. So he is single-handedly re-establishing manufacturing as an important economic activity in the United States. His counterpart in China is Wang Chuanfu, uh, who has uh, founded BYD. That was a battery company. They were, they were producing lithium ion batteries. And he said, well, um, if we're producing batteries, why can't we produce electric vehicles? After all, in his view, the electric vehicle is simply a battery on wheels. So he takes a very, very uh, distinctive perspective on this. He doesn't see cars as complex systems with their complex transmissions and all of that. He just sees it as a battery on wheels and what's the cheapest way we can make it. So his company, BYD, anybody know what BYD stands for? Bring your dreams, bring your dreams. A nice idea uh, in the case of China. And then in uh, Japan, following the Fukushima disaster, uh, large scale uh, entrepreneurs like Masayoshi Son, the founder of SoftBank, which is uh, Japan's equivalent of Apple. Uh, he turned against uh, nuclear and started to promote uh, renewables in a very serious manner. He founded the Japan Renewable Energy Foundation and uh, they are pursuing <coughs> the goal or the, the ideal of a trans-Asia uh, electric grid running on renewable energy 
generating wind power and solar power in the deserts of uh, Mongolia and uh, transmitting uh, that right through China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, and through the entire uh, Asian region. That's the uh, Asian supergrid, and Masayoshi Son is behind that, and uh, no doubt he will be a multi, multi-billionaire uh, as a result. So business opportunity. So you look at, well, where is the commercialization going on uh, with the perovskite uh, solar, P solar cells? Uh, again, provided the technical issues can be tackled successfully and dealt with, we see a, an enormous industrial revolution getting underway now. I put it to you, you don't often uh, sit at the ground floor of an industrial revolution, but that's what is going on here. Uh, getting the costs down uh, is going to be uh, the key, and you get costs down through uh, market expansion. That was the case with the crystalline silicon solar cells, as they were able to undercut thin film solar cells, they were able to do that because the global market expanded. And who was driving the global market expansion? It was Germany. Now Germany, of, thought, of course, <coughs> thought that they were doing that for German producers. They couldn't anticipate that it would be Chinese producers who would actually be the major beneficiaries. So it was Germany acting to expand the European market, China acting to do the manufacturing and take advantage of the uh, lower costs, uh, and that's what uh, undercut uh, the uh, new generation solar cells being developed by companies like Solyndra and Kanaka. So with this new industrial revolution involving perovskite solar cells, that must not be allowed to happen. So the costs for this new generation need to be brought down as fast as possible. And one way forward, which is be being developed uh, by Professor Green, and, uh, and yourselves here at uh, UNSW is for tandem cells to combine the best of silicon with the best of perovskite uh, to introduce a premium product. That's a very good way of introducing a new product to an established market. It makes a lot of business sense uh, and it makes a lot of sense in terms of industrial dynamics. So we have some early movers already, but uh, clearly this is going to be a crowded field just as the early uh, automobile market in the United States around Detroit saw hundreds of uh, producers before it uh, settled down to the big three in the United States. Well, we can expect something similar as this industrial revolution works its way through. Clearly getting lead out of the picture and uh, being substituted by something a bit more benign like tin uh, is clearly going to be <coughs> a very important issue. So, huge market trillions of watts, trillions of dollars uh, we should be talking about here. And then uh, there's even more. Uh, if you look at putting these uh, cells together, uh, you can actually uh, generate enough uh, energy to split water, and that would be a new source of hydrogen uh, with vast applications across the entire economy, scalable, non-toxic solar hydrogen. So it's an exciting, it's exciting times. We're actually witnessing the beginnings of a very important industrial revolution. So what does drive costs down? And here I have to say uh, that uh, my colleagues in the world of economics have uh, singularly failed to understand and to convince people as to the real drivers of cost and how you can bring costs down in order to grow markets. But there's a universal process. As markets expand, costs come down, and they do so through efficiency improvements, which are driven by competition. That's what's called a learning curve, uh, and it's the same whether we're talking about automobiles in the United States 100 years ago, or solar photovoltaics in China uh, in the present period. In Henry, Henry Ford uh, started it all with his uh, Model T Ford, dropping the costs year by year uh, in order to expand the market, and his sales just went through the roof uh, from a low level of 6,000 in 1908 over 800,000 by 1917. This was a phenomenal industrial revolution, created the world's automobile industry as we know it, established the United States as the lead player in that industry. So you couldn't overestimate the significance of what actually happened. And it happened because as the market expanded, the costs came down. So you start with an expanding market, that stimulates manufacturing efficiencies through the division of labour. 
That stimulates cost reduction, which drives further market expansion, which generates further efficiencies and further cost reductions. Now, these cost reductions come certainly within firms, but they come mainly along the value chain. That's the power of value chains that uh, companies interacting with each other are, are stimulated to drive their costs down in order to uh, get the custom along at the next leg of the value chain. And we see this uh, as a chain reaction uh, called circular and cumulative causation. I suggest you do a Google search uh, for circular and cumulative causation and see how many hits you get. My guess is, I haven't done it recently, my guess is that it would be under 10. And yet here we have the central driving dynamic of the entire industrial capitalist system not studied in the way that it should be. Let me then turn to uh, finance uh, and investment. And uh, we see a promising uh, curve looking here. Uh, already by 2011, uh, investment was getting up to a quarter of a billion dollars uh, a year. Uh, jumped for, to, a, sorry, a quarter of a trillion dollars, I should say, US uh, billion 250. Uh, already it looks very, very large, but uh, actually what happened in 2012 and 2013 was that it stayed at that level or even lower. So that looks large, but I want to show you that it's really only the very, very beginning. What about the availability of finance? Well, we see we're interested in what uh, serious institutional investors uh, have at their disposal. Institutional investors means pension funds, or what we call in Australia superannuation funds, insurance companies, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds. These are the serious professional investors. And according to the OECD, they have uh, uh, a $71.1 trillion under management. Right? They don't own that. They are managing those funds and they are looking for investment opportunities. So there's $71.1 trillion looking for investment opportunities. Now, most of that is going into fossil fuel industries and fossil fuel investments. That's the way the banks are working. That's the way the stock market works. So the issue is how to tweak this system and channel investment funds towards the renewables from these institutional investors. So the, the scale needed uh, is very, very large. If you count the investment costs as, say, four euro per watt to build uh, wind farms, for example, uh, then when you look at the, uh, at the complete, uh, uh, the, the total uh, renewables needed, it would be something of the order of $50 trillion over the next two decades, from uh, up until, say, 2030. So the current proposals under the, Kyoto, under the now defunct Kyoto Protocol uh, was for a, a global climate fund of $200 billion, nothing compared to what is actually going to be needed. That global climate fund is all based on tax-based finance, but it's not tapping the real sources of finance in the capitalist system. We, we see with climate bonds or with green banks or with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation here in Australia, we see a start towards building a different kind of institutional structure to channel uh, finance towards the, uh, the, the renewable sector. Uh, it's all debt finance because the stock exchanges are not really helping. Uh, equity finance uh, driven by the stock exchanges is largely going to fossil fuel investments. So how do we tap the finance from these uh, institutional investors? You tap them with capitalist instruments and the capitalist instrument uh, de, de rigueur the, the one that is the most important is the bond. The bond markets are the largest institutions in capitalism. And uh, we see when uh, organisations like the European Investment Bank have been issuing uh, what they call climate awareness bonds ever since 2007. They've been ramping them up. They've been issuing them in different currencies. Just recently, they got over the billion dollar mark with a 1.5 billion bond in the year 2014. The World Bank has been doing the same. So they are testing the waters. They are demonstrating in practice that investors are prepared to buy these bonds and the funds can then be channeled towards renewables. Development banks like the African Development Bank are now starting to move in as well. So there are many kinds of financial instruments available. 
which provide the key to the greening of capitalism, not using tax-based public finance, but bond-based finance uh, as generated within the capitalist system itself. And my favourite example is from the Korean Export Import Bank issuing its green bond last year. This was a $500 million bond uh, designated exclusively for climate related investments, for clean technology, targeted at institutional investors. Well, it was oversubscribed, very, very successful bond issue. It was uh, all its investments will be audited by a third party called Cicero. That's the Centre for International Climate and Environmental Research in Oslo, in Norway. Uh, the spread across the globe was uh, important with American investors, European investors and Asian uh, investors taking up this bond issue. Very high credit rating, so it carries little risk. The interesting thing was that this was issued by the Korean Export Import Bank. So all the projects have to lie outside Korea, have to involve a Korean company like Hyundai or Samsung working with a local company in some other country like Indonesia or India or China. And uh, so uh, to sweeten this, uh, the Korean Export Import Bank in a very smart move said that coupon payments would be made from consolidated revenues, not from the necessarily from the revenues of the projects themselves. Now clearly they can't repeat that over and over again, but it was a sweetener uh, to get uh, this particular bond issue off the ground. Now that means that anybody prepared to work with a Korean company somewhere in the world outside Korea on a substantial renewable energy project can count on finance from the Korean Export Import Bank. So I say that to trigger your own thinking about where the sources of finance might be as you scale up the perovskite uh, solar cell revolution. So this is just a chart to show you what the global capitalist system looks like. Uh, it's worth around 225 trillion, way more, as you can see, than is needed to finance the global energy transition. So anybody who tries to argue that the global energy transition is too expensive, which is all the language of economists, they're just not aware that ho of how the real capitalist system works and the enormous scale of financial instruments that are actually available and looking for safe investment opportunities. There you see that equity markets account for 50 trillion, but the bond markets combined account for 100 trillion. That is twice as large. Meanwhile, the equity markets, the stock markets, are pumping funds into the black uh, fossil fueled economy. Uh, and uh, this is uh, data from the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Uh, in London that has uh, been making waves with their concept of stranded assets, uh, frightening investors all around the world with the idea that anything that they invest in fossil fuel activities uh, will never be able to generate uh, future revenues and will never be able to be sold. So they're stranded assets. It's a very powerful concept, a very a concept that makes, uh, that makes the hairs on the necks of investors stand up on end. Uh, so there are powerful uh, forces working to green the, uh, in the uh, international economy. And some of these forces are emanating from the fossil fuel companies themselves. So they're not all stupid. They're not all just trying to hold back uh, renewables in a negative reaction. Some of them are looking post uh, fossil burn at the burning of fossil fuels. And uh, instead of looking at a future for fossil fuels, as the feedstocks for petrochemicals. Now this is all along what fossil fuels should have been used for as petrochemical feedstock. Yeah. They're beautiful structured molecules, so complex, that is where they belong as feedstuffs for uh, complex materials like uh, uh, plastics. But just by burning them, we've been wasting so much and we've been creating so many problems with the carbon emissions. But now companies like ExxonMobil, BASF, uh, BAS and, and Total, Braschem from Brazil, Shell, Dow Chemical, and many, many more are starting to look beyond the phase of burning these, uh, these uh, complex materials and looking to see them as uh, driving a new phase of the petrochemical uh, industry. So if coal seam gas, the cheap, uh, cheap coal seam gas in the United States, is driving out coal from the thermal power market, and if solar and wind are driving out gas, then the smart players 
like these are looking to a future for gas that doesn't involve burning it. So watch that space uh, and uh, it's important. So overall then, what is my message here? What, what, have, what has been my argument? That what is driving China's energy revolution and the associated uh, resource uh, effectiveness, resource efficiency revolution through the circular economy? And why do we expect India and Brazil and Indonesia and these other countries to follow China's lead is probably not to do with climate change, which these countries see as a, prob a problem created by the West and therefore the onus is on the West to solve it, but more uh, they've got the bigger problem of cleaning the dirty skies uh, from the carbon uh, and smog emissions uh, and above all the energy security issue because they don't want to be hostage to those geopolitical pressures created by being dependent on oil imports and coal imports as I showed you in that earlier chart. So if they're dependent on oil and gas from Russia or Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Nigeria, then the future is war, revolution and terror. And they want a different future. China wants 50 years of peaceful development. They won't get that by being dependent on oil and, uh, and gas. So the manufacturing of renewables makes abundant sense. They can apply the latecomer strategy that they can see was worked so effectively by Japan, and then Korea, then Taiwan, then Singapore. These are all the models that China is following, and China is doing it at a larger scale and with a larger domestic market. So China is different, uh, and uh, China, but China is following that latecomer strategy, uh, and uh, it's doing so with a strong state which is able to develop these five-year plans uh, to drive industrial development. This relieves their energy insecurity. It clears their skies. Really, what is there to lose? So the issues are that uh, the age of renewables has actually arrived, but it's not being led by Europe or the United States or even Japan. It's actually being led by China. It's being led by China because China is the country that is driving down the costs. And it does so because the markets are global. And as it drives down the costs, so it makes it possible for other countries to follow a renewable energy revolution. India first, and then uh, other countries like Brazil. Uh, we talk about uh, issues like uh, carbon credits, but really these are, not the, uh, these are not the answer. Carbon credits are simply going to cre create yet another financial bubble. They'll make a few merchant bankers and a few investors rich but they won't do anything to get the world off fossil fuels. The way the world will get off fossil fuels is through investments in renewables and expanding the scale of production of renewables. That's how the world will get off uh, fossil fuels. And that means channeling serious finance towards uh, the investment in renewables. That's why you need uh, investment uh, institutions uh, like the bonds, the green bonds, climate bonds, green banks, uh, and uh, there you can see also the role of some of these new institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank about to be launched uh, by China. Uh, I read recently the United States is fundamentally opposed to this initiative by China. It's uh, lobbying very hard behind the scenes to block this initiative from China and yet this initiative would be one of the key uh, initiatives in channeling finance towards the green economy. My point is that if capitalism created this problem, then we shouldn't be looking away, averting our gaze from capitalism uh, in trying to find a solution. We should be embracing what capitalism can offer, and what capitalism can offer is new kinds of banks, new kinds of bonds, and new uh, channels of financing. So that just basically uh, sums up what I've been saying, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll skip that uh, to, uh, to uh, move to the end and uh, give you time for questions. But you know, the, the key point is we're talking about an industrialization process that will raise the incomes and the wealth, not just of hundreds of millions of people, but billions of people, and to do so in a way which will not cost the earth. So it's not zero growth, that I'm talking about here, which is a popular topic. People say, oh, we can't go on growing. Well, tell that to the China, tell that to India, we can't go on growing. Of course they have to grow, but they have to grow in a green manner 
which will not cost the earth and in particular will not blacken their skies and render them so uh, liable to energy insecurities. So they, as a matter of course, have to adopt a green development model. And the interesting thing is that we see them doing so. We see the beginnings of this uh, green development model. Uh, but the question is still open. Uh, will they do it uh, with sufficient uh, strength and vigour? And will they do it in time? Well, there are no answers to those questions. Just to give you some background, uh, this is my paper on uh, manufacturing, increasing returns and energy security that was published in Futures earlier this year with uh, Eric Reinert from Norway. That uh, paper is available. And this is the book that uh, will be coming out next month with Stanford University Press, Greening of Capitalism, How Asia is Driving the Next Great Transformation. I should just explain that title. Uh, there was a wonderful book published in the 1940s on capitalism as the great transformation. Nothing would ever be the same again. And so my title is saying the greening of capitalism will be the next great transformation. But this time it's being led by China. Asia is actually driving it. So there you are and I've actually finished in time for some questions. Comments or questions, please. So, Richard. Um, John, this morning's Sydney Morning Herald had an article uh, quoting people for investment managers from Australia's Future Fund. Uh, it's headlined Future Fund sticking with fossil fuels and talking about divestment from fossil fuels, for example. Um, they, they, they take a very they see divestment as a last resort and seem to be seem to be pretty much assuming that that the risks will be the risks of stranded assets of of, the, um, of that not being the leading technology or being um, being already being built into the share market prices because other people will see the risk and will, will cross it down. So they're sort of taking very much a follower attitude rather than a leader attitude. Um, well, my, my response to that is that finance is driven by people who have uh, the prospects of making money. Now, the, the Australian Future Fund can take an ideological position and say we're not going to uh, invest in renewables, we're not going to divest investments in fossil fuels, but they're against the tide. The tide is rising towards renewables. We can see that's what's happening with the way China is going, with the way India is going. Then through competitive emulation, other countries will be going in the same direction. We can see the way the bond markets are moving and eventually the equity markets will move that way as well. So people can take an ideological position and stand against that tide, but you know, you and I know which way it's really moving. Is it likely to come in a sudden rush, a slide, and they'll be caught with their hands down? Uh, eventually they will. If, if, they're, not, if they're not putting the... Uh, the, we the wealth under management of the Australian Future Fund into where the future lies, then eventually uh, that uh, will run out, of, run out of returns, yes. But you know, if you look at uh, what the serious investors around the world are doing, they are making this shift. Uh, the most important one that far outweighs uh, this statement from the Australian Future Fund was from the Rockefellers, the Rockefeller brothers themselves, the very man who invented the whole fossil fuel system. Uh, in the 19th century through Standard Oil. Though his, his heirs, I think they're the great, great grandchildren, uh, they've announced that they're getting out of fossil fuels. There could not have been a more symbolic statement, rich in symbolism, the Rockefeller brothers getting out of fossil fuels. Well, everybody can read what that means. Um. Like with, with that comment of Rockefeller uh, Brothers, um, with the comment that you just made about Rockefeller Brothers, or the another example that you you, you showed in your uh, presentation for, with the Exxon Mobil uh, tra transiting toward the um, refineries uh, for not burning gas, yeah. um, well, th that that does make sense that uh, they are not relying on uh, fossil fuels for burning them mm -hmm. as a fuel. But how about the percentage of the fossil fuel use in transportation systems? Uh, do they 
see the uh, mm, the global perspective that yes, uh, out of this much of energy that uh, we 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 are relying on, uh, this much is for transportation and this much is for electricity production. Yeah, but the the point is that uh, the fa the focus on transport uh, through electric vehicles uh, will also be linked to the production of power in a in a you know renewable power. So. The more that the world moves off the internal combustion engine and diesel driven engines towards electric vehicles, uh, the more uh, demand they create for renewable electric power, which would come from uh, renewable systems. And uh, that's where uh, Tesla Motors in the United States is leading the push as well, because they see their future electric vehicle fleets as basically very, very large energy storage systems. So they will have a big impact on the automotive industry, a big impact on the battery industry, and ultimately a big impact as an automotive company, a big impact on the power industry because of this huge reservoir of energy that will be there in their electric vehicle fleet. Please. Um, you made some comments about um, carbon taxes and carbon prices and perhaps not being as effective as they should be. We've seen struggles with Kyoto and Copenhagen. Do, do you think that with this change that perhaps those sorts of meetings will no longer happen? That, that the market will simply take over and there'll be no necessity? Look, the market will take over, but the market would be infinitely enhanced if there were strong international agreements driving it. Now, my point about the canal to railroad revolution was that it wasn't driven by taxes on canals and neither will the transition to renewables be driven by taxes on fossil fuels. But it would certainly help if the subsidies to fossil fuels were discontinued, which are still far greater than any subsidies paid to renewables. So if the subsidies to fossil fuels were discontinued and if the real costs of producing coal-fired electricity had to be paid for with a carbon tax, it's just that it won't, it's not capable of carrying the transition but uh, to you know, finesse the transi transition that is underway, uh, it would be uh, you know, really great to see that. Now, let me say something about Kyoto. Kyoto all along was doomed because it relied on individual countries to make carbon emission reductions uh, and the finance uh, that was discussed within the framework of Kyoto was all public finance, tax-based finance. They never engaged with the world of capitalist bond markets. They never mentioned the role that bonds or green bonds could play. Now, with the Paris conference coming up next year for some successor to the Kyoto Protocol, which is now defunct, doesn't exist anymore, but there could be a Paris Protocol as of December next year. Now, that Paris Protocol, in my view, if it's to work, will have to go way beyond carbon taxes and way beyond statements about carbon emission reductions, it will have to engage with the world trading system and with the world financial system. Seriously engage. Now, how would it engage with the world trade system? Well, the trade system goes along at the moment without any reference to uh, climate change. So countries uh, that uh, seek to build their green industries like China and India are being taken to the courts in the WTO and being charged by other countries like the United States or the European Union with uncompetitive behavior. But what they're doing is trying to build green industries. Now the WTO has an enormous opportunity with the Paris Protocol to actually step up and say, we agree that green industries have to be built and we agree that competitive stipulations have to be relaxed for a period of time say just five years, so that a country can build a green industry uh, without being taken to the WTO for anti-competitive behavior. So that, if that link between the WTO and the UNFCCC could be established under the Kyoto Protocol, it would be an enormous okay. step forward. Likewise, there needs to be some engagement between these international conferences and the finance sector. So it's not just a case of uh, creating some stupid fund like the Global Climate Fund, just $200 billion, just, a, just nothing, just a drop.
But if there were a serious engagement with a set of criteria that define what we mean by a green bond, as established by an international conference, then banks all around the world could issue such bonds and say these are green because they meet the criteria spelt out by the Paris Protocol. So you see, there's enormous scope for sensible international agreements, not the stupid half-hearted agreement that we saw under Kyoto. Questions, I think time's up anyway. So thank you very much, John, for a very stimulating conversation. <laughs> thank you.